Ah, look at me go. All right. So uh, Simon, Buckeye, and I are doing a presentation uh, or an independent study on UEFI and UEFI boot kits. Um, so we've been learning a lot about UEFI, and Nick asked us to make a presentation, so we made one. Um, it's just a simple overview of UEFI and some of the uh, firmware security features that are present in UEFI. Uh, so I guess let's just get going. So before I talk about UEFI, I guess we decided to mention uh, the old system of boot, which is BIOS and BIOS MBR. Um, the boot process before you hit an operating system uh, is responsible for a set of tasks that allow your computer to um, make it to the point where you can load an operating system. So you have to initialize uh, your video card so you can see the screen and interact with it. So you need to configure your plug and play devices, aka your keyboard, um, do a memory test so that your RAM doesn't fail, uh, simple things like that. And it was a standard for a really long time. Um, but it's 16-bit, and it sucks. So when Intel went to move to Itanium processors, which were 64-bit, they realized the limitations, and they decided to develop what was known as EFI. Um, and then eventually they moved to uh, have it be a third party, run the standard, and now it's UEFI or uh, unified um, extensible firmware interface. So uh, BIOS runs, uh, BIOS utilizes the MBR, uh, or the master boot record for partitioning, which uh, introduced in 1983 and just lives on the sector zero, or sector zero of your hard drive. Um, it has a bunch of limitations that if you've ever tried to dual boot, you probably figured out. Uh, four partitions capped at two terabytes, uh, it sucks. Uh, you have to create lot, uh, extended partitions and then logical volumes if you need enough partitions to add multiple operating systems on one drive. And two terabytes is not a lot of data anymore, at least. So uh, they created uh, UEFI. Um, UEFI. Um, is a specification for how um, one might write firmware. It is not firmware itself, but it dictates to firmware vendors how they have to develop their software so that um, it has the API calls that um, application developers for UEFI can rely on so that their code will run. It goes through a very different process than MBR and BIOS boot. Um, so it uh, starts uh, with the platform initialization, which is not covered by the UEFI spec itself, but is instead covered by uh, the PI spec, um, which UEFI also manages. Um, it starts um, It starts by loading uh, drivers so that it can set up the EFI environment. And um, these drivers are loaded by um, the, these drivers are loaded in the DXE phase, which is the driver execution environment. And they're loaded by um, the DXE dispatcher, which looks into the firmware and finds the correct boot order for uh, drivers. And then once the drivers are loaded, it uh, runs EFI applications and the EFI applications uh, run a series of services that culminate in calling essentially Grub to launch Linux or the Windows bootloader for Windows. UEFI has a large set of improvements over BIOS. It reduces the number of 60, uh, six, the, reduces the amount of 16-bit code, uh, embraces 64-bit so that uh, you can have larger partition or larger um, disk sizes and more partitions, um, and then for developers, me, Simon, a lot of other people, 
it added a bunch of really nice features like C and C++ support um, and a GUI and object-oriented interfaces so that I don't have to write 16-bit assembly every time I want to write something uh, that runs at boot time. So these are just the set of, or uh, a set of services that UEFI has. Uh, boot time services are run at boot time after the driver execution, uh, after all driver execution runs, and they are terminated uh, as the boot sequence hands over to the operating system loader. Uh, runtime services run while the OS is running uh, and provide things like time interface. And then applications can kind of just be anything, uh, which is fantastic for us because we can just write anything. Um, they live on in ESP, which was not covered. So uh, UEFI uh, has two parts. It has firmware and drivers that live in uh, on uh, a ROM chip, um, a read-only memory, and then it has uh, your NVRAM variables, which live in non-volatile RAM, um, which dictate where the firmware looks for the boot files. And those are stored on your uh, EFI system partition, which you set up when you partition for EFI. Um, this is where grub lives. So if you wipe a hard drive, you'll wipe your, uh, you'll wipe your ESP. But if they wrote a malicious driver, it lives in firmware, it will persist. So if you can write a driver that's malicious and it loads uh, a malicious file um, for, during your execution of UEFI, then a reinstall or a new disk will not get rid of it. So how do you protect your firmware? There are two main methods of protecting firmware. Uh, this one, uh, the first is measured boot. It uses generally uh, a TPM to record how long and a bunch of other measurements about uh, your boot process. And if anything is different than normal, it will warn you in a log file. But it doesn't actually stop the boot from happening. And no one really looks at log files. So you can generally just get away with booting, even if measured boot catches it. Uh, so secure boot was introduced in uh, the UEFI spec after a while. Uh, 2.3 is not too long ago. They're currently on 2.7. Uh, and it essentially just creates uh, a bunch of signatures that sign next level down and creates a chain of trust. Um, people sometimes give secure boot a hard time because it can keep Linux from booting in certain scenarios. Uh, but in reality, you can turn that off in the BIOS on any uh, x86 uh, or 64-bit Intel processor because Microsoft determined that if you wanted to be Microsoft certified and get cheap Microsoft licenses, that's how you had to do it. At the same time, they also dictated the exact opposite for ARM, which is why sometimes ARM secure boot is locked and you can't disable it by booting into a BIOS, which kind of sucks but I don't run a lot of ARM things, so I don't really care. Um, so the secure boot keys, there are four databases of keys. The platform key, it lives in your firmware, and it is usually your firmware vendor's key. It signs uh, a bunch of other keys uh, that live in your key exchange key database, um, and these can be like, Windows has got a key or a bunch of keys, and different Linux distributions that are popular have keys. And those are used to actually sign the drivers that will either get run or not get run. And those drivers, uh, the allowed ones are in the DB, and the forbidden ones are in the DBX. And that's secure boot and UEFI in a nutshell. Does anyone have questions? <laughs> 
Pierce. What prompted you to start looking into this? So they released a write-up uh, right around the time when we were looking for an independent study. Uh, there was a write-up about a Windows um, boot kit that took a um, it took a driver written by uh, a company to uh, track a laptop in case it got stolen. And that driver w lived in uh, the firmware and uh, persisted over reboots, or, I mean, re uh, reinstalls, so that if they replaced your hard drive, you know, it would still beacon back and show you where the laptop was. But malicious people took it, and they made it for Windows, and it installed their malicious files over and over again. And we thought it was really cool that you could persist on the computer over a reinstall, something that a rootkit generally won't allow. Um, so we started looking into it. UEFI has a generally simple, especially compared to BIOS, development environment, uh, though it's not as simple as we hoped. Um, so we decided to just go for it. And uh, we're actively working. Hopefully, we'll have some POC code by the end of the semester, seeing as it is actively our independent study. And we'll give a presentation on that when it kind of culminates. This was just like an introduction into UEFI, so people kind of know what it is. Cool. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, Nick wants.